Hallelujah. Come on, there will be glory. There will be glory after this. Amen. How many of you know that there will be victory after this? There will be victory after this. See, look, my God, he'll turn things around. God will turn it around. He will bring you out. He will bring you out. There will be glory. There will be glory after this. I believe you got it. Come on and help us sing. There will be glory. There will be glory. Yeah, come on, put your sign up in. There will be victory. There will be victory after this. Come on, I don't think y'all really mean it. Because see, my God, he turned things around. God will turn it around. He will. He will bring it around. There will be glory. There will be glory after this. Watch this. See, my God, he specialized. He specialized in things impossible. Things impossible. And he loves to move. He with all your hope is out. And so he just will give up. Will show himself on your behalf. So don't give up. Because he'll come through. He'll come through for you. Come on, there will be glory. There will be glory after this. Yes. And there will be victory after this. There will be victory my God, he'll turn things around. God will turn it around. He will. He will bring you out. There will be glory. There will be glory. There will be glory. There will be glory. Come on, there will be glory. There will be glory after this. All right, right now, I want you to go ahead and give God some praise for all the marvelous things he's done and how he's brought you through. How he's going to bring you through it all, how he's already done what you've asked him for. See, there will be a praise after this. Come on, there will be a praise. There will be a praise. After this. After this. And there will even be joy. There will be joy. After this. After this. You will even have a testimony. There will be a testimony. After this. After this. Come on, there will be glory. After this, after this, come on, there'll be a praise. There will be a praise. After this, after this, he don't even have my joy. There will be joy. After this, after this, yeah, yes, see, you don't even have a testimony. There'll be a testimony. After this, after this, yes, and see, there'll be glory. There will be glory. After this, after this. Come on, we're going to sit right there and say, after this. After this. Can you help me say, after this? After this. Yeah, see, every test and every trial. After, after this. this. Yeah, one more time. After this. After this. Come on, let's say, there will be glory. There will be glory. Come on, there will be glory. 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 Come on, there will be glory.
I am encouraged. Open your mouth and glorify our God and let them know that you believe that it's not over. Let them know that there will be victory after this. Let them know that there will be breakthroughs. Let them know that there will be healings. Hallelujah. After this. Let them know that it ain't over. Hallelujah. Until God has the final say so. Until God says the word. It's not over. Come on, clap your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what it looks like in the natural, know that God, who is a spiritual being with all power and authority, has not spoken and given the last word. So when God gives the last word, hallelujah. Come on, somebody say, it ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. You got to believe in your spirit. And when you believe in your spirit, it begins to manifest itself out your mouth. And you begin to speak victory over your life. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. Glory to God. It ain't over. It ain't over. Go start saying it ain't over. Hallelujah. It ain't over. It ain't over. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God. Get your Bible. Get your Bible. Get your Bible, hallelujah. Oh, bless you, my God. Get your Bible and go over to Ezekiel chapter 37. It ain't over. Until God says it's over. Keep fighting until your victory is won. You got to keep fighting until your name changed from defeat to victory. You got to hold on to the past. You got to believe that God is in your corner. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. I do magnify you, Lord. For the victory, for the victory, for the victory. Hallelujah. I know it seems like the odds are stacked against you. Like there's no way out. Hallelujah. It seems like the enemy has everybody lined up in order to defeat you. Everybody lined up in order to trip you up. But I'm here to tell you that God is able. He's able to turn what seems to be impossible into the possible. Hallelujah. By your faith will you receive your deliverance. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you're over in Ezekiel chapter 37, give me an amen. Hallelujah. I'm ready to worship today, y'all. I promise you, I'm ready to worship. Brother Keith, you got that mule for me? I may have to tie my mule up now. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, come on, come on. Worship him until you get your blessing right now. Worship him until you get your blessing. If you need something for him, this is the atmosphere. In the atmosphere of worship, God begins to move on your behalf. In the atmosphere of worship, God begins to touch your situation. He begins to touch individuals who are able to pour themselves out into your pocket, into your situation. Until your victory is won, oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh Lord, we can. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. You're ministering to me. You're ministering to me. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. Hallelujah. God can do it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. I like what was being said this morning. I tell you, I just look so moved because, you know, it, it says there will be blessings after this. This is just a situation. You're just going through a situation. You are a spiritual being, huh? You are a spiritual being going through a physical situation. But guess what? The spirit already has the victory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. It ain't over. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's move on into the word of the Lord. And this is just so fitting. Everything that's even occurred on today is so fitting for me to be able to minister to you today what the Lord has dropped into my spirit. Hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 37. Hallelujah. I'm going to take those words and I'm going to, to teach on this morning. You guys, some principles here that are going to really bless you. 
Ezekiel chapter 37, and guess where we start at? Verse 1, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ezekiel chapter 37, once you're there, go and give me an amen. amen. If you're not there, bless God. <laughs> hallelujah. Girl, don't you start nothing now. We don't do nothing. You got that mule pole in the ground real good with concrete. Ooh, hallelujah, I'm there. Bless the name of our God. Hallelujah, God is doing a new thing. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 37, the word of the Lord reads as so. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me in, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, <laughs> can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord, God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you take your seat. Hallelujah. And Father, we thank you for your word today. Let your word go forth and bless your people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning to everyone. I am just so encouraged by what God is doing. He's yet blessing in the midst of situations. The government may have shut down, but guess what? My God is still in business. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. As we examine the scripture above, as we examine the scripture above, a very familiar so story begins to unfold. Here we have the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel, he was a prophet of Israel during a very trying time in Israel's history. The Israelites were in Babylonian captivity. They, they were being slaved out. Israel was in a terrible situation, but Ezekiel, Ezekiel was a man who was different. He was a prophet of Israel, and he came from the bloodline of the Levites. He came from the bloodline of the Levites, of the, tri of the tribe of the Levites, and he was a member of the family line called Cohen. He was one of three major prophets who prophesied at this particular time. There are three major prophets whom Ezekiel must have been familiar with. We're talking about the prophet Daniel. Hallelujah. Amen. We're also talking about the prophet Jeremiah. Ezekiel was probably contemporary of these people. But in his story, Ezekiel said something interesting. First of all, he was challenged by God to speak by faith to these very dry bones. How many of you got some dry bones in your life? And you know you need to speak by faith to those dry bones and to cause those bones to begin to live. We all go through dry periods in our lives, times of depression, times where we get discouraged, times where we don't know which way to turn. But there are times in your life when you go through these things, these trying times, it's not to destroy you. These times are to build you up and to bring you out and to cause you not to fail again. These times, these times are, they're very trying, they're very trying. In this story, though, Ezekiel says something interesting after God had challenged him to speak by faith to these dry bones. Look at this. God says, son of man, can these bones live? Can these bones that were once flesh and clothes, can these bones that, that, that were once filled with muscle, can these bones which have become bleached by the very sun, can these but wants you to believe that his word will be fulfilled. God will take you to jail so he can show you he can free you. God will take you, God will take you to hell to show you that he can deliver you. God will take you to cancer to show you that he can heal you. God will take you to unemployment to show you that he's a way maker out of nowhere. God will take you to brokenness. Oh my God. He will take you to hope to show that he can feed you. This is the kind of God that we serve. Hallelujah. Right. Hallelujah. Ezekiel seems to have said with a certain bit of uncertainty. And don't get mad at Ezekiel, because we get the same way too. We speak in terms of lack of faith, not in terms of faith. Right. We begin to speak and prophesy death to ourselves when God said we should speak life. 
Huh? We begin to speak and tell our children they're going to be absolutely nothing when God says you need to tell them they're going to be everything. Huh? We begin to, we have our doubts and stuff, and we allow our doubts to drive us, my God. And when you begin to focus in on your doubt, what you focus in on becomes your God. Huh? What you complain about becomes what leads you, what guides you, what directs you. Whatever you are worried about is what you're going to draw to you. Oh, my God. Somebody better hear what I'm saying here. Somebody hear what I'm saying. When you begin to speak life to your situation, you draw life to your situation, huh? When you begin to say, I am a winner and not a loser, you become a winner and not a loser. When you begin to say that I am a lender and not a borrow, you begin to get fat bank accounts. When you begin to believe God in spite of what it looks like in the natural, God begins to move on your behalf. Oh, my God, my God. Oh, my God. We spend so much time talking about there is no way instead of saying he is the way. We spend so much time saying that I've already been defeated instead of believing that we've already been victorious. We spend so much time worrying about how things are going to turn out when God says, I shall supply all your needs according to my riches in glory. Oh, my God. We spend a lot of time being worried about things. But Ezekiel spoke in terms of uncertainty, you know. He deferred the answer back to God. As he deferred the answer back to God, it is indicated there was a lack of faith in his life there. Oh, you probably missed it there, but it was indicated there. Because Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. Lord, you know. When God is telling you that you should know, that you should believe, that you should say, yes, Lord. Huh? You should say, yes, Lord, when it seems like it's impossible. Huh? When the odds are stacked against you. Oh, my God. When the doctor's giving you a bad report, when the doctor said that you have sugar diabetes, the doctor said that you have cancer, we spend so much time claiming and talking about my cancer, my diabetes, my illness. Stop saying my. Start declaring as if it's not even there in the first place. When you go to the doctor, you may say, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, they say it's there, but I believe God. Oh, my God, my God. I'm telling you, the power of the tongue is something else. You begin to speak that thing, boy, I tell you what. Woo. I've seen skinny people become big because they begin to speak saying they were big. Huh? Okay, amen. I've seen ugly people become pretty because they begin to say I'm pretty. Huh? When you begin to speak things into your life, those things begin to manifest themselves in your life. The issue is that we go focus in on the problem and not the promise. Huh? If we can start focusing in on the promise of God and stop being so focused on what is the problem. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My God. Hallelujah. So Ezekiel said this thing. He's like, Lord, you know. You know. You know, Lord. Lord, you know. Ezekiel spoke with uncertainty. He told God that God knows, but God wants us to know. He wants us to believe. He wants us to acknowledge. He wants us to begin to confess. He wants us to begin to believe and cause things to manifest themselves in the natural world. Oh, my God. I can see Ezekiel right now. He had been brought to this place of desolation. And we want to be Ezekiel, but let's be real. He had been brought to this place of desolation. He probably perhaps felt a slight breeze. He's, he saw how many, many seasons had passed since these bones had saw life. And perhaps like us, he had immediately looked at the situation with doubt. Huh? When Ezekiel described it, he first said in the first verse, God took him to a place where the bones were dry. But as Ezekiel sat down in the place, huh? Ezekiel himself said the bones were very dry. Huh? Look how Ezekiel caused the problem to be escalated by looking at the downside of it instead of looking at the life that God began to speak. Oh, my God, my God. Ezekiel looked at the problem. He looked at the problem. He had been brought to this place of desolation. He had saw how these bones had been there a long time. And as he looked doubtfully at the situation, his focus became his own limitations instead of God's possibilities. Right. We get to that point, don't we? We begin to, to a point where if it's all dependent on me. If I don't do it, it won't get done. If I don't do it, if it gets done, it won't be done right. Huh? Oh, my, my God, the shit. No, I'm going to say something. 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 I'm, can I say something? Huh? I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. There are many ways to skin a cat and each and every way hurts. 
huh? There are many ways to accomplish something, huh? And each and every way will probably accomplish the same thing. Oh, my God, my God. We got to get to a point in our lives where we trust that God will show us the right way to go about doing something. Oh, man, she was saying this morning, she, what she said this morning about uh, doing something, she said you can do the right thing at the wrong time. Huh? There's a song you used to sing, something like that. Go the right way at the wrong time. Oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I'm looking for somebody about my age who remember that. Amen. Huh? There are times in our lives where we are told to do the right thing, but God wants us to hold back for a moment until he sets the situation up so that the right thing will become the right thing and not a curse in the lives of others. Oh, my God. I'm going to move on with that. My God. Perhaps like us, Ezekiel began to look at the situation with his human doubt, and he looked at his limitations and not at God's ability to turn things around. Ezekiel, like us, began ignoring the promises, huh? God had promised that he was going to bring the children of Israel out of slavery in due time. God had promised that they would not languish in slavery in due time, but God had also promised if they did certain sinful things that they would go into slavery. Oh, God's promises do come true. You may say, well, where is the promise here? Where's the promise? Let me teach you on this, this thing here. Huh? I got to teach you on prophecy this morning. Where is the promise here, Pastor? To see the promises, you must understand the prophecy. Huh? You have to understand the prophecy. First of all, Israel had sinned, and God had allowed the Babylonians to raise up, to conquer them, to punish them for their sins as God said he was going to do. Huh? This type of thing happens to us sometimes. Where the where Babylonians were based, they were real bad enemies of the Israelites. You wonder why sometimes your enemy seems to have the upper hand. You be wondering why is it that he seemed like he got the newest car, the latest house, the latest fashion. He got everything going for him, and I ain't got nothing going for me, huh? When you get into a situation like that, you begin to you need to start looking at your life and start determining what's in your life that's causing God to be displeased with you. Oh, we, we do old Christians, we real bad at that, right? Well, Lord, I go to church, I give my tithe, huh? No, you only gave three dollars the last year. <laughs> Lord, I do such and such and such and such. No, as soon as you walk out to church, you begin to bounce to Beyonce and give me your bounce on, give me your bounce on. Huh? Knowing that you're living only a half-baked life when God has called for us to be fully baked and fully ready and fully prepared for the battles which we face on a daily basis. Oh, my God, my God. Huh? We, we bad about that, aren't we? We bad about that. See, Israel had, had, had gained to a point where their enemies triumphed over them. Hmm? And your enemies can triumph over you if you live in a half-pleasing life to God. Israel had sinned greatly here, and they were now in captivity, and in their captivity, they cried out to God. Oh, we bad about that, aren't we? Huh? We bad about that, especially us as a race. Hmm? We bad about that. When we in trouble, we band together. We cry out to God. We cry out hoping God will hear us. Oh, Lord, hear us. Hear our cry. But the moment we get out of trouble, we forget all about God. When the moment we get up getting a job after being unemployed for a long time, we forget all about God. Huh? The moment we end up getting our healing after being sick a long time, we completely forget about what God has done to heal us. The moment, oh, somebody better hear what I'm saying. Somebody said a moment. The moment you end up, the moment you end up being pulled out of jail, you forget all about God and begin to do the same things that you did before to get into that bondage in the first place. We forget about God, huh? The same as there are positive promises, there are negative promises too, huh? Because if you are doing what God has called you to do, He's going to bless you with the positive promises. But if you're doing things that are contrary to the will of God Almighty, He's going to bless you with the negative. Oh. There are consequences. There are consequences. So we got to talk about prophecy here. Israel sinned greatly, and they were in captivity. They cried out to God. What represented life to them was having a victorious army. What represented life to them was having strong, violent soldiers. What represented life to them 
huh? What represented life to them had been taken away from them. What represented their death was bones which were laid in a valley, huh? Not just bones, but very dry bones. Bones which had long ago seen their last vulture, huh? You know it's bad when the bones are so bad that the, the, the vultures won't even fly over no more. They don't pick every bit of flesh they can off of, huh? Every piece of gristle they can, they don't find them, they don't pick it off of, huh? As no more meat left in them whatsoever, the marrow has dried up, very dry bones. Oh, but in this prophecy, what we have to understand is that God was telling, telling Ezekiel that these dry bones represented Israel. These dry bones represented Israel. Israel, who was in the valley surrounded by high mountains. Those high mountains represented the Babylonians. We got plenty of mountains that are around us, right? Plenty of mountains that we, we, we've been told years ago, singing that old song, Lord, don't move my mountain. Forgetting where the word of God says, you speak to this mountain, says, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. You ain't got to worry about it no more, huh? You ain't got to worry about that situation. When you begin to speak to a mountain and tell that mountain to get out of your way when you pass through that way, and when you come back through that way, that mountain is no longer there. You ain't got to climb it two times. Oh, my God. So Israel, Israel, in spite of all the sins of Israel, God, who's loving and kind, said that I'm ready to restore you. Oh, somebody ought to touch themselves and say, I'm ready to be restored. I'm ready to be restored. I'm ready to be restored. Huh? I'm ready to be restored. I am tired of going through what it is that I've been going through. I'm ready for God to restore all those promises that he made to me. I'm not going to focus in on how I look right now. I'm looking into the future, and I look a whole lot better in the future than I do right now. I'm not focused on how broke I am. I'm looking at the riches that are going to come forth by my obedience to God Almighty. I'm not looking at how hungry I am. I'm looking at the steaks that I will eat in my upcoming future. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God had told Israel if you sin. Hmm? He had told him if you sin. He even made a promise when he was dealing with Solomon. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and I, I, I heal the land. Huh? God said that. He said that. But he also said that if my people do, and this is further in that scripture, he said, if my people turn and transgress against me, then I'm going to cause somebody to raise up and to pull them into bondage. And when they're in bondage, if my people who will call by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn toward my temple, that's why the Muslim born toward the east, and turn toward my temple, will I bring them out of the bondage in which I caused to fall upon them? That should make somebody make somebody think about some stuff here. Hallelujah. Make them think about some stuff. See, when we were in sin, we were in a very dry place. We were in a droughted land. We were in a, and the thing about being in a dry place, you notice you can't learn anything while in the drought. Hmm? While in the drought, your mind is focused on trying to get some water, huh? But when you come out of the drought, you ain't worry about what the water's gonna be there because you know it's already there. Woo. Somebody's going to get that tomorrow. They're going to shout on you. But God took the sin which had us in that dry place and brought us the moisture, which is the blood of Jesus. Many people preach on the dry bones, but they don't take the time to explain to you what the prophetic meaning of the dry bones is. They don't take the time to really let you know that the bones methodically represent something. These are famous bones. Everybody and his brothers, the bones, the bones, or the back bones, the neck bones, every bone is connected. People do that. They talk about the bones, but they don't tell you what the bones represent. They don't let you know that God can cause those bones to raise up and become much greater than they used to be. Yeah. My God, my God. See, the bones were, were in a valley. The valley represented a place of, of a low place of subservient to the high mountain. The high mountains, of course, were the Babylonians. There are some dry areas in our lives where we are in the valley of indecision. Yeah. What God is telling us, in order to come out of the valley of indecision, you got to make the right decision. Right. Huh? you got to make the right decision so that you will be able to speak to that mountain, tell that mountain to get out of your way, so that the valley will become the high place and the mountain become the low place. Right. 
Oh my God. You got to take the situation and begin to change the situation around by being in a right relationship with God. You can speak to those mountains and cause those mountains to begin to shriek right before your very face. And whereas you previously had to walk up high, you can walk down low. I was, um, I was I was watching TV the other day. I wasn't really watching TV. I wasn't really watching TV. You know how you have a TV on and TV watching you? Huh? TV watching you. You know, I thought I was watching TV. I was watching, but I wasn't really looking when the Lord began to speak to me on some things. You ever been that way where you're in deep thought on something? In deep, just real deep thought on something? This is the place where, and, and, and Sister Tammy, you're going to notice when your kids get older. This is the place where your kids will take advantage of. They'll ask you for something right then. Were you in deep thought? Huh? While you're paying the bills or trying to figure out how you're going to pay the bills. Huh? They'll ask you a question. They'll ask you for something that you have told them many times before no. Hmm? They'll ask you, can I have such and such? And then you, when you see them, like, what you doing with such and such? You said yes. You said I could have it. Then you have to investigate a little bit. And say, well, what was I doing when I said you could have it? Well, you was paying bills. You, you, were, uh, you were holding nitro in one hand and glistening in the other. Huh? You had two swords in your hand. You're trying to put them down without cutting your hand. You said I could have it. This is an area which we have to be careful as the saints of God. Because the enemy will try to come to you and ask your permission when you're in a very dry place. Uh -huh. When you're in a place of valley of indecision, he'll come to you and try to ask your permission. Huh? This is why he did what he did to Christ. He tried to take Christ to a very dry place. But even when you're in a dry place, you got to remember who you are and who you are. You got to remember that you are God's child. You are above and not beneath. You got to remember that though I may walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. You got to remember who it is that God has called you to be and designed you to be. You got to remember you are more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. You may not look like a conqueror right now. You may look like death warm over. You may look like the feet warm over. But I'm here to tell you that you are already victorious in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I was sitting there in my, my I was sitting there and, and something caught my attention. Something caught my attention. And it was something that one of the people on TV said. He said, we need to focus on the promises. I was like, oh my God. I mean, let's be honest. I was sitting there and I was actually worried about something. I was worried. I was, I called myself being concerned about something. But there's an area in our lives, there's a point, there's a point in time where as we move from the realm of being concerned to the realm of being worried. Huh? Yeah, I got a lot of things going on that I need to take care of. I got a lot of decisions that I got to make. I got a lot of things that I would say I should be concerned about. But the thing is that I can't be so concerned that I move over into the line. I step over the line and I'm worried about it. Huh? The thing about God is God goes in mind you having a plan. That shows the nature that God has and he wants you to have a plan. Right? But you got to have a plan where God is able to interject into your plan and cause things to occur the way he wants them to occur. Oh, that's all well and good. God said, look at my child. He's thinking. I'm glad he's thinking and stuff. But I'm going to throw this curveball in because I want him to go in this direction instead of that direction. Huh? God has, oh, boy, I was ministering one time and I was talking about how breadcrumbs. God places breadcrumbs on the path he wants you to take. Huh? He throws little nuggets on the path that he wants you to take. And when you begin to run out of those little nuggets, then you're probably on the wrong path. When you don't begin to see the hand of God at work on the path that you're on, then you need to reassess what path you're walking on, and you need to start focusing in on the path that God wants you to walk on. See, God places little crumbs along the way in order for you to pick them up and say, thank you, God, you already provided for me on this path. But if you're walking along the way and you can't find a single crumb of bread, you might need to look at something again. Huh? You may need to reassess some things. You may need to reassess some things. 
But as I sat there and I, I began to, to meditate on focusing in on the promise of God, automatically it came to me that I was spending too much time on the problem. I was worried about the problem and not focusing in on the problem. Oh, we all go through that, don't we? We go through that. If you don't go through that, raise your hand. Oh, okay, I thought so. We all go through that where we're so worried about the job. Worry about how we're going to put food on the table. When the word of God says that never I've seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread. If your seed begging for bread, you need to go back and read the book. You need to relook at some things. You need to figure out what it is that you are doing that's not pleasing to God. Because you should not only should you not be hungry, but your children not should be hungry. Huh? Oh. As the word became clear to me and I, I began to feel this word began to grow inside of me. I, I realized that, that worry is a problem that we all deal with. Worry is a problem that we all deal with. Worry though itself is the antithesis of faith. That means it's the exact polar opposite of faith. Huh? It's not as strong as faith but if we allow word to become strong, word will become strong. Huh? Worry, worry. The realm of worry has pitfalls not only spiritual but physically as well. Huh? Yes. Spiritually, it has pitfalls. And we pretty much should know what those pitfalls are, but we also have pitfalls physically. You can become sick with worry. Yes. Your body will cause itself to begin to deteriorate because you're so worried about what it is that's going to happen. When you have no control over what's going to happen, the Lord said being worried will not make you taller, will not make your hair grow, but being worried will put you in the grave. What you worry about. Huh? When each and every promise of God determines that you've already made it through. There's not a single promise on the positive side of God that says that you're going to fail. Huh? Each and every promise of God, oh my God, what does it say? Yes and amen. Oh my God. God has said this, I'm telling y'all. I'm, I'm going to look at the meaning of word here for a moment. Let's look at worry as compared to concern. I read where as a Christian shouldn't worry because all you are doing is borrowing tomorrow's sorrow or pulling tomorrow's clouds over you today's sunshine. The American Heritage Dictionary defines worry to be extremely uneasy, troubled by anything. Troubled by anything. But as a Christian, the only thing that we should even worry about is something that's already taken care of. We should worry about where the soul is going to come to Christ. Huh? That's the only thing that we should really strive. Oh, my God. We should really strive for. The word teaches us in Philippians 4 and 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Guess what? God already knows, but he wants you to verbalize it out of your mouth. God places great value on your positive confession. Huh? When you begin to speak positive about what God is going to do, it causes God to show up and show out in your situation. When you begin to speak life instead of death over your situation, God will open doors that no man can shut and close doors that no man dare even touch, let alone open. In other words, look to the Lord. Look forward. And watch his promises begin to manifest. The scripture in Philippians 4 and 6 is backed by John 14, 13, which states, Whatsoever you ask in his name. Huh? As we review this, we become acutely aware, should become acutely aware of Matthew 6 and 33. Huh? Huh? It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, if you take care of the business of God, God will take care of your business. Huh? If you do what God wants you to do, because the problem is that when we begin to worry about things, we begin to serve the wrong master. Huh? But when we begin to speak by faith and begin to take care of the things of God, we begin to serve the right master. And when we begin to serve the right master, things begin to happen that causes the word to clear up. Right. He will take care of all things in his time. In his time, we will need to spend our time worrying. Getting the word of God is what we need to spend our time doing. Getting the word of God in our spirits is what we need to spend time doing. Allowing his spoken word to bring forth the blessings. I, I'm one that believes in boomerang blessings. 
I believe in boomerang blessings. You know, you know what boomerang blessing is? Huh? I need something. It's over on this side of the room. I began to speak the word. Come here, Brother Keith. When I spoke the word, the word went out. And when I spoke the word, I said I needed someone in the church. I needed another male figure in the church to help me in order to do the things I need to do. And when I began to speak that word, I spoke the word, and all of a sudden you show up at 80 Court Street knocking on the door. Pastor, can I help you with anything? Huh? When you begin to speak the word of God over your situation, it causes your faith to go out as a boomerang and grab hold of what it is that you need and brings it to your plane of existence so that you will get the blessing that you Oh, my God. Hallelujah. I think Brother Keith spoke over that tie because that's a nice tie. Brother Keith, boomerang they caused that tie to come into it. And a, oh, a handkerchief too? Well, bless the name of our God. Hallelujah. See, I believe in that boomerang faith. How many of you know, how many of you need to start speaking some boomerang faith in your life? Right. Huh? I need a job. I'm working at McDonald's, making minimum wage, but I need a blessing. I need a healing. The doctor said I'm sick, but I need a <clears throat> healing. Huh? Amen. I need deliverance. They say I'm going to jail, but I need the <clears throat> deliverance. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I need a breakthrough. They say there's no way out, but I need a <clears throat> breakthrough. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. If we spend time focusing in on what God has already promised, then the problem has no room to grow. If you begin to focus in on the problem, you begin to fertilize the problem. You begin to sow seeds of worry into the ground. And what you sow into the ground is going to come up multifold. Hallelujah. Let me give you guys some promises of God. I got some seven promises of God I want to focus in on real quick. Seven promises of God. He has promised that he shall supply your every need. Amen. According to what? His riches and glory. Huh? His riches and glory. Well, we got to understand what riches and glory means that God has no bounds on what he can get. Huh? God has no restriction on what he can get. Whereas we can only write a check in the natural on certain things only up to the amount that we have in a bank. God has an unlimited bank account. God has a blank check. And if God wrote that check, oh, I just think, thank you, Lord, for writing that check in my life. Hallelujah. I need a blank check from God. Huh? I need a manifestation of the blessings of God in my life. Oh, my God. I need God to move in my life. Oh, my God. Yeah. See, see, when, when God promises he'll supply all your needs, you notice how God obligates himself. Huh? He obligates himself. This is like what it says in Malachi. Try me, test me, and see when I not pour out a blessing you have not room enough to receive. I don't know about you, but I need a blessing that overflows. I need a blessing that fills my cup to the maximum and begins to spill over the side. I need a blessing where my children will be able to come up and take some off the edge of the cup because I need a blessing. Oh, yeah. hallelujah. I need a blessing from God. I need a blessing. Hallelujah. God obligates himself to, to the extent of your needs. Includes food, clothing, shelter, companionship, love, and salvation through Jesus Christ. Huh? That's the first promise. God has promised to supply your every need. Huh? The thing about God is that God is so good once he supplies your need because you are having living a Matthew 6 and 33 life, which is seeking ye first the kingdom of God. God begins to supply a lot of your wants, too. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? I'm a witness of it. I'm a witness of it. When I stopped wanting the things of the world, God began to give me everything that was in the world. Right. Huh? When I stopped desiring whether I would have a nice car, God began to give me a nice car. When I stopped desiring, oh my God, whether I have a nice house, God gave me a nice house. When I stopped desiring whether I have a nice position, God gave me a nice position. And as I speak this word to you right now, you got to get inside your spirit is you need to start seeking God first. And when you begin to seek Like a little bad boy, huh? He's like Dennis the Menace, 
I always poke and sticks at you. I know you're going through something, but God says that greater is operating in you. Huh? He says that not only will he provide all your needs according to his riches and glory, not only will he do that, but he'll give you enough grace inside of you to deal with whatever situation comes up. Never will a problem be greater than what it is that you can bear. There may be some things that I can bear that you can't bear. There may be some things that you can bear that I can't bear. But God knows what it is that I can't bear, and he'll give me enough grace to make it through. Yeah. Your problem may be whatever it is, but God has enough grace. His grace is not lacking. Hallelujah. Third thing. God has promised that his children will not be overtaken with temptation. Talked about that. He ensures there will always be an escape. Think about your life and think about everything you did in your life. Everything that was sinful in your life. Now look around inside that situation. You see a door was there always. There was always a way of escape. Huh? There was always a place where you could have made a different choice than the choices that you made. Huh? There's always something there in, a, in order that God, God can use in order to pull you out of that. Huh? The word of God says, I lay before you life and death. Choose what you will. And God then says, choose life. Choose life. Choose life. So with every temptation, huh? so with every temptation, there is a way of escape. St. Jude wrote it this way. He said, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you falling before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. Oh, I love that scripture. Huh? Now unto him who's able. Huh? If he's able to keep you from falling, that means that he's able to provide something in order to keep you from falling. He's able to provide a way out of a way. Oh, my God. He's able to provide a way for you to make it through instead of you just going through. My God, my God. I like what the, what the pagan king Darius, king of the Medes, said to Daniel. He said, thy God, whom thy servants continually, he will deliver thee. That's a pagan king. He said, the God, Daniel, which you serve continually will deliver you. That's really something when someone who's a pagan begins to speak that over your life. Begins to speak life instead of death. The God, whom thy serve continually, he will deliver you. And God did deliver Daniel from the lion's den. The fourth thing. God has promised us victory over death. He has promised us victory over death. Amen. He resurrected Christ the same way that he's going to resurrect us. Huh? Come on now. God has promised you that you will live and not die. Amen. God has promised that you shall have a home in heaven. Oh, my God. This is the thing about God. God says, to him be the glory. To him be the power. To him be the honor. To him be the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh my God. You begin to speak things into your life. God is going to manifest those things in your life. When you begin to focus on what God has already done instead of what it is that you're going through. Amen. Fifth thing. God has promised that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. Right. He didn't say something. He didn't say something. I know we're going through some stuff. There's something going on always. But we learn to focus in on the promises. Like, like this lady who was killed in D.C. That, that just really disturbed me. Right. That bothered me. Seemed like they could have done something more. They could have tased her. They could have chased her down. They could have done anything besides shooting that poor lady. But if you spend time focusing in on the problems instead of the promise, huh? You focus in on the problem, the problem being her being shot down like she was, instead of the promise that these things must come to pass in order for God to manifest himself in this earth. Right. Huh? We spend ourselves, spend our time focusing in on the problems. Oh my God. Like like the young man, there was somebody in DC on the other day on Friday. Pour gasoline on himself and set himself on fire. Killed himself. Huh? You know why? Because he was focusing in on the problems with this country and not the promises of God. Huh? When you find yourself, when you set yourself up for failure by depending on man, 
Huh? When you set yourself up for failure by trusting that man is going to do what it is that you have elected him to do. huh? When you set yourself up for failure by thinking that man shall supply all your needs according to his riches here on earth. When you set yourself up for the failure by believing and trusting that they're going to do everything. Oh my God. You need to set yourself up for a relationship with God where you will trust God no matter what it is that men do. Whether men go up there and do what they're supposed to do in these or not. When you begin to trust God, I'm telling you, I, I'm like this. I'm like this. I love, I love the pastor. I do. I love, I love the pastor. But I love the Lord a whole lot more than I love pastor. I love the Lord with my whole heart. And I'm doing what he has called me to do. Amen? Amen. But the one thing is that they'll never, you know, you, you won't ever catch me out of character where Whereas I'm concerned when you call me pastor or mother. You won't ever catch me out of character like that because I'm more concerned with I'm more concerned with doing what God has called me to do. I don't ever want to get to a point where his people are lifting me up. Huh? Because when you're being lifted up, you're being set up. Huh? When people begin to speak all these great things over your life, I take everything with a grain of salt and I make sure I defer all the glory back to God. Huh? You won't ever find me to a point, and I, I know that the Lord is blessing this ministry to be a great ministry, sir, but you'll never find me to the point where I'm going to hire a bunch of bodyguards where I'm untouchable. Huh? You won't ever find me to that point where I think that I don't stink. Huh? I, I'm telling you, ooh, my God, I almost did something there. I'm going to say something. Just say I almost said something. Hallelujah. It may be difficult for us to see and understand how this is accomplished, how God, everything works for the good of those who love the Lord. It may be difficult for us to understand that during times like this. But we have to still focus in on the promises so that God will deliver us. The sixth thing. God has promised those who believe in Jesus Christ and are baptized for forgiveness of their sins will be saved. Amen. God has promised those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, believe, not only believe, but confess. Those who, who denounce sin, huh? who denounce the enemy as their master. Because I'm telling you, that's really what it is. When you are not saved, then you are serving the wrong master, and the enemy is your master. But when you are saved, and you confess out of your mouth the belief that is within your heart, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and you ask him into your life for forgiveness of your sins, and for a new direction, a new dance partner, then God is just and faithful enough to bring you out of whatever it is that you you've been into. There's no sin too great. There's no crime too great that God cannot forgive you and move you up into, oh my God, this is the kind of God we're talking about that'll make pre uh, pimp preachers. Well, huh? Right. This is the kind of God we're talking about that'll make poor evangelists. Huh? Right. This is the kind of God that we're talking about that will, that will make the worst sinner into the greatest saint. Huh? This is the kind of God that make a thief the greatest giver the church has ever seen. This is the kind of God that we serve. And if you know something about yourself, what you should know about yourself is that this God has made some promises to you. And because of his great promises, oh, you need to start living the promises. Start walking. Start manifesting the promises. Huh? Start saying, I am somebody in God. Huh? Begin to speak. Oh, my God. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm excited. Because I'm seeing what God is doing in some of your lives. Amen. God is blessing you guys. I'm telling you, I get, I get all misty-eyed and teary-eyed when I start thinking about where you were when you came here. Yeah. Huh? Where you were when you came here. How you were so downtrodden. Some of you say you ain't been to church in 30 years. Some of you don't know anything about a preacher. Don't care nothing about a preacher. All you think the preacher wants is a big piece of chicken. Some of you guys were so downtrodden, so depressed, so beat up with the law of the land instead of being minister of grace that you didn't understand that God loved you. You thought God was an overruler, a beater. You, oh my God. You believe, oh, you believe in God as the Lord of tribes. He was the, the Yahweh, is the God who will beat you up. The God who will tear you down. The God who's sitting back in the cut waiting for you to do something so he can punish you. Huh? But I get misty-eyed when I think of how far God has brought you. I get misty-eyed. I get carried away. I get excited and I think about how far God has brought you and how far he's going to take you. 
I get excited when I think about the goodness that he has placed in you and how God is going to bring even more out of you. I get excited when I think about the call that he has placed on your life and you begin to walk in that call that Christ Jesus has placed on you. Whatever it is that you can think about, God has already provided for you. Whatever it is that you stand on this evening, that you can think about, God has already provided for each and every problem, huh? Each and every problem, each and every problem is already solved. Hmm? There's no great mystery in the things of God. The great mystery is why people don't believe. That's a great mystery to me. As I always, always say in my spirit, and I'm manifesting it out of my mouth right now, the issue isn't the problem. The problem is a lack of faith. The problem is a lack of faith. Each and every promise of God is manifested, invested, and fulfilled in Christ. The promise of God are yes based on who we are in Christ and a man which goes up before God at his glory. That was deep in there. Yes, based on who we are in Christ and a man which goes before God in his glory. See, we say amen when we agree to something, right? We say amen when something has come to pass. Huh? When we say amen, we actually put glory up before God. We worship in God when we say amen. Lord, I thank you for what it is you are doing. Amen. God's promises are yes and amen. Amen. In the natural, the challenges are great. We got a lot of natural challenges. A lot of things are going on. But if you can just believe in your spirit, believe in your spirit. You believe that oxygen is there even though you can't see it, don't you? Huh? You believe it's there even though you can't see it? So if you can believe something that you can't see, then why can't you believe the one who made the oxygen? Why can't you believe the one who breathed that oxygen into your life and made you a living soul? Why can't you believe what God has already done for you in your life? Before the natural is manifest, before the natural is manifested, we got to have belief. We got to have faith. And those who have faith are given authority. They're given authority. If you got faith, you're given the authority. Huh? You're able to speak to your mountains and tell them to be removed and be cast into the sea. You're able to speak to your body. I'm telling you what I do all the time is I touch my body, I touch my heart, I touch my stomach, I touch all around my body, and I say you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Get in line with the word of God. Function right. Act right. Blood flow right. Mother Crockett, which I don't, you guys may or may not have met her. She came here. She was, her husband was my pastor in Virginia. She had lived a life where she lived, she grew up real rough. She grew up extremely poor right here in the state of Arkansas. Grew up extremely poor. Where she was the abused of people. People abused her. And when she got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, fire baptized, speaking in tongues. She grew in the Lord, grew in faith. She wrote some books. And one of the books she wrote was Rise Up, Old Woman, and Deliver Your Child. Amen. Huh? That's telling you that no matter how great your situation is, if you are in a relationship with the Lord, you can rise up and cause yourself to be moved. You can rise up and cause yourself to be delivered. You can begin to speak to yourself and cause self to get in line. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. You know, the thing is that when we speak, we need to speak clearly. Speak clearly what it is that we want of the Lord. Huh? We got our angels who are sitting back there waiting, beckoning for us to call on them. Huh? To call them and put them into motion. And when we begin to pray the promises of God, when we begin to declare the promises of God, we place them into motion. But if we don't speak clearly what it is that we need from heaven, then we 
cause our angels to sit back confused. Don't know what it is that you want. But when we begin to speak the things of God over our life, over our situation, when we begin to speak with clarity what God has already declared about us, then the angels go into motion. They begin to go out with that boomerang. I don't know about you, but I'm going to throw some boomerangs out today. Hallelujah. I'm throwing some boomerangs out today. Because by faith, I believe it. And by faith, I receive it. By faith, I'm already an overcomer. By faith, it's not based on how you look. It's not based on how you smell. It's not based on how good your hair is. It's not based on how smart you are. It's based on your faith. By faith, I already have the victory. Faith gives you power by the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Faith, faith. We need this power. Preacher on last week said something that really was profound to me. Endured him thoroughly last week. He said something that was really profound. He said, no power, no possibility. Hmm? No power, no possibility, which means that we need power in order to have the possibility. Amen. If we don't get the power, then we will never have the possibility. It will never occur if we don't have the internal working power of Holy Spirit working in us to work things out around us. Lift your hands all the good. Leave that alone. Hallelujah. Oh, how great are you, God. How merciful.